All right, welcome back everyone. We are now at the final presentation of day one, and we are lucky to be joined by Dr. Chris Busy for this plenary. Dr. Busy is an assistant professor of environmental health inequities with Simon Fraser University's Faculty of Health Sciences, where he also holds a Michael Smith Health Research BC Scholar Award. He led the implementation of some of Canada's first comprehensive climate change and health vulnerability assessments in collaboration with applied public health practitioners and has worked to influence environmental policy at the local, provincial, and national level to promote human health and well being. Welcome, Dr. Busy. Thanks so much, Maddie, um, for that kind introduction and good morning and afternoon to all. I want to um, just give a, a huge um, thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me and to say how humbled I am to be with you all today. Um, but before I begin, as is our custom, I do want to acknowledge that I'm joining you today as a third generation settler on stolen land. I'm calling in as an uninvited guest on the unceded and unsurrendered lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil people and certainly want to express my gratitude for their continued stewardship over these lands uh, and the millennia old wisdom that these communities uh, bring to this, the topics that we're talking about today in today's call uh, and their ability um, to connect land, animal and human health. And certainly also grateful for our other thoughtful panelists and presenters and uh, note that I'll be drawing on many of the things that folks like uh, Brett and Dana and Kaylee and others have begun to pull on. So I really see uh, my role today, I think, is one of provocateur and to do some of the um, kind of deep synthesis work that draws in elements from across today's speakers. Uh, a little bit about me and to provide some context. Uh, my background is really in environmental public health with a strong focus on understanding the health impacts of climate change and what we do in public health practice to respond. And um, I, I participated in uh, and led some of our country's first climate change and health vulnerability and adaptation assessments. I'll be drawing on some of those experiences while I make my remarks. However, uh, I do want to note that I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist, so we'll rather be speaking from a generalist perspective. And as someone who's given some really concerted thought uh, to the emergence of One Health and other subfields of environmental public health practice, uh, and where I see the opportunities for One Health to make some contributions to this space, uh, how we might avoid some of the pitfalls along the way, and, and certainly in, in doing so, I'm going to draw on... Um, emerging insights and certainly the established leadership that we've got in this space uh, in Canada from the works of uh, Nick Ogden and Sabrina Mugureka, among others, uh, with the hopes of sharing some insights from the world of One Health surveillance. So if I had to boil my talk down into a few takeaways, I think it would first and foremost be that we spend 100% of our time in living systems and that climate change acts as a risk multiplier for many infectious diseases because of our, our unhealthy relationship with those living systems. Um, they demand our attention in public health and, and certainly in infectious disease practice. And this really relates, I think, to my second takeaway, which is that infectious diseases have a really long history in influencing how societies around the world organize, and, and which is to say, in short, that environmental changes can certainly precipitate social changes uh, and vice versa. And being attentive to the dynamics of living systems necessitates consideration of how those systems interact with one another, uh, and certainly um, how environment, social, and health systems uh, are in a, a dynamic uh, a conversation. Um, the third point is just that the risks of, of infectious disease transmission are, are, are not equally uh, distributed. I'll talk a little bit about the equity dimensions and really probe at some of the limits of One Health thinking in that particular space and um, how it really demands equitable consideration of not only how we conduct surveillance in this space, but also how we direct resources towards adaptation to ensure that our response to this emerging crisis is just. Uh, and fourth and finally, uh, you know, a really important, I think, key, key takeaway that's coming through loud and clear from our early presenters is that Canada has a relatively high degree of adaptive uh, capacity towards climate sensitive infectious diseases, uh, but certainly One Health tools and approaches might actually help us mitigate some of those future risks. So I'm gonna try and start my presentation by bookending um, some of the bad news, presenting some future trends and future risks of infectious disease and a changing climate uh, by sharing what I refer to as the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, before returning to an overview of several One Health initiatives that I think offer us some really significant lessons that we might be able to apply in Canadian practice uh, and, and really support our response in ways that are mindful of the connectedness uh, that we have to living systems. Uh, and then to conclude, I'll just share some high level reflections on challenges and opportunities uh, that might help us move forward and, and, and bring us back to some of those key takeaways that I just mentioned. So the good, 
Well, we know that um, you know infectious diseases of humans and animals have played a really significant role in our evolution as a species. You know, from the plague outbreaks in Rome in the second century to the Black Death. You know, fast forward to present day with the the emergence and reemergence of Ebola and SARS and MERS and Zika and COVID nineteen. You know, many of these epidemics and pandemics have necessarily, I think, forced us to really improve quite rapidly our scientific understanding uh, of those diseases and our communicable disease response. Uh, and so, you know, on this slide, the point that I'm really trying to make is, is to harken back to that point that Canada, I think, has a high degree of, of adaptive capacity. We've seen significant um, uh, focus on vaccine development and deployment. Uh, we've got a really strong focus, uh, an emerging focus on understanding some of the uh, regional vulnerabilities and some of the regional um, sensitivities that exist to emerging infectious diseases. Uh, and we've, we've spent a lot of time building up expert scientific capacity in this particular space. Um, drawing from some of Nick Ogden's leadership in this space, but there are certainly, you know, several reviews of Canada's infectious disease um, surveillance over the years that demonstrate some of that positive movement that I'm referring to. And uh, I like this framework in this article, not just because of the provocative title, but I think that, you know, in looking back in the, over the 12 years since this piece was actually published, we can actually see how this framework has rolled out in Canada and how it's actually really nicely laid out this interface uh, between researcher roles and responsibilities in terms of assessment of the state of knowledge and the development of new knowledge and iteration on existing uh, surveillance systems, uh, coupled with the development of novel in, uh, intervention opportunities uh, in tandem with our public health responsibilities and the public responsibility um, to be um, educated, to communicate as, as close to real time as we possibly can, to conduct and participate in epidemiological investigations. Uh, and, and really ensure that the public is involved in terms of providing uh, robust and democratic feedback uh, on the entire suite of activities that we're running uh, as public health practitioners and researchers. And I'm gonna be referring back to a couple of these different lever points um, uh, throughout my presentation, but you know, certainly um, the Health of Canadians in a Changing Climate Report that was just released in 2022, uh, again, authored by Nick Ogden, really fantastic suite of resources. If you haven't checked out that document, an incredibly comprehensive review of a variety of different climate sensitive risks. Um, you know, one of the resources that's, uh, that's linked through that actual resource uh, is the, uh, the exemplars that we've got in public health surveillance. We've heard a lot today about Canada's emerging strengths uh, around Lyme disease surveillance, uh, West Nile virus uh, degrees surveillance. Uh, and we certainly got a good uh, taste of some homegrown examples uh, of this in BC from Quinn Stewart. Um, so my thanks to Quinn for that great presentation. Um, these two examplars, you know, I'm really, I'm just highlighting them, uh, where, uh, highlighting a few examples where good work is happening within our, um, the, the, the broader kind of involvement and engagement uh, of multiple stakeholders. And uh, certainly, um, Ariane, I think, did an awesome job speaking to another fantastic exemplar and one of the kind of earliest iterations of where we're starting to see One Health surveillance pop up in Canada, uh, which is Quebec's One World, One Health surveillance collaborative that's very much oriented towards a, a climate-informed One Health approach. Um, and you can kind of see the, the wealth of expertise that this is, initiative is bringing. Uh, and I think Ariane could speak to this better than I ever could, but um, I really appreciate, I think, this group's commitment uh, towards moving knowledge to action in this split space, especially in terms of some of the kind of knowledge translation events uh, that they've run in the past and that they, they continue to run uh, well into the future. So a really significant stride, I think, in terms of One Health leadership in the Canadian scene. So that's the good. Let's talk a, a little bit about um, the bad. You know, we, we, we've got this relatively high adaptive capacity in Canada. We have reasonably high levels of awareness um, for, for contemporary uh, climate sensitive infectious diseases, strong research and scientific community, you know, a really uh, robust public health surveillance system that's constantly evolving, uh, especially in the wake of, of the global pandemic. Uh, and actors who are already lo lo leveraging a, a whole host of novel and integrative approaches like One Health uh, to support continued innovation. But we know that um, climate change is likely to significantly modify um, our exposure risk. And exposure here, uh, the, the likelihood certainly depends on uh, the level of the hazard, which is you know, the number of infective organisms in our particular environment, um, what the, that, that in an individual's environment necessarily looks like, the rate of contact between uninfected humans um, with that given hazard. Uh, and in the context of infectious diseases, adaptive capacity certainly is, is not only our public health system's ability to identify and prevent and control disease, uh, or, or minimize the impact of disease through rapid and effective treatment, um, but also in terms of bolstering public awareness uh, uh, writ large. And so we've, we've talked a little bit about 
um, uh, this in the former, uh, uh, or we, we know a little bit about this from the existing surveillance, uh, uh, but some of these things are becoming an increasing challenge in Canada. Um, again, we, we heard from Quinn's uh, presentation, uh, a really specific example of Lyme disease uh, established cases and risk expansion uh, in British Columbia. This is a map from the government of Canada looking at Lyme disease risk areas in 2022. You know, we know from some early Canadian research that uh, the black-legged tick and tick vector uh, is experiencing a northward expansion of anywhere from 35 to 55 kilometers a year as a result of warming. Uh, bird range certainly makes that uh, much more difficult to ascertain in terms of potential risk portfolio or, or risk profiles. Uh, and we've heard a number of speakers speak to where incidence is the highest, and, and certainly in Nova Scotia, uh, which based on um, current reporting back in 2019, reported about 85.6 cases per 100,000 people relative to the national average of, of seven uh, per 100,000. And so certainly this is projected to increase under a changing climate, but of course not everyone will be equally exposed to the risks of emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. We can certainly anticipate um, the folks who work outdoors, people who live more in rural and remote locations, uh, folks who out, uh, recreate outdoors are likely to have elevated risk portfolios. But we also know uh, that people who are more physiologically sensitive um, are likely older adults and people who are immunocompromised. And this is where we start to, to see the interplay between demographic change uh, and, and the, the evolution of infectious disease risk. And, and we know that Canada's um, older adult population is expected to grow by about 68%. Uh, to 10.4 million people by 2037, uh, with a near doubling of the 75 plus age group. And, and we certainly know that this group is more likely to interact with the health system at baseline, but it's their sensitivity uh, to infectious disease that makes them a particular population of concern. In terms of adaptive capacity, we, we also know that, you know, despite um, all the good work that we've, we've already referenced, the recent pandemic has begun to reveal uh, not only some of our strengths that, and, and the strengths of our health system, um, but also some of these um, some of these cracks. And we, we know that we're experiencing significant strain uh, in terms of our workforce with high levels of, of, of burnout. Uh, and, and certainly if you were a climate change researcher in kind of early 2022, you saw a lot of the oxygen get sucked out of the room and as, as public health en masse began necessarily responding to COVID uh, as an acute emergency because it necessarily demanded our attention uh, relative to the slow mo moving emergency that was climate change, uh, which is so often punctuated by acute emergencies. And certainly that shift uh, was concerning for a lot of us that really saw us, at, at least in Canada, really on the precipice of making significant inroads um, to, to advancing the practice uh, of climate change in, in, in public health um, more generally. And if you think that's the bad news, well, I, I've got some ugly news. Um, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, but we, we certainly also know um, and, and we continue to learn a lot about emergence in complex systems when it relates to infectious disease. So uh, it's not necessarily just climate driven, uh, weather, climate events, population movement, land use changes, urbanization, global trade patterns, other drivers can catalyze a succession of primary and secondary events that can actually lead to a range of cascading health impacts uh, where infectious disease is implica implicated. Uh, and these, these types of kind of cascading um, risk pathways um, that are characterized on this slide uh, can often be um, causally connected events that result in some of these large scale outbreaks that affect society at large. Um, we also know that you know, the exposure risk to climate sensitive infectious disease is also modified by other ongoing environmental and humanitarian challenges. Uh, and certainly a lack of robust international surveillance will continue to hamper our efforts domestically uh, uh, in the wake of continued globalized migration and, tra and travel patterns. So really what this is a call for as we uh, become an increasingly globalized and interconnected world uh, is not only getting our house in order in terms of our, our provinces uh, and, our, and, and Canada writ large, uh, but also being active um, uh, participants in a uh, emerging uh, global community of infectious disease re researchers um, which I think the pandemic has demonstrated to us beautifully. Uh, the other ugly news, we you know we know that infectious disease poses a considerable um, degree of disease burden, um, certainly across Canada and the planet. The Global uh, Burden of Disease Project estimates that about 26% of mortality globally is attributable to infectious disease. Uh, we know that more than 58% of pathogenic uh, diseases can be exacerbated or worsened by climate change. Uh, and we've certainly seen recently 
some really um, significant players in the climate modeling scene and James Hansen really raising the profile and raising the level of concern uh, about our potential inability uh, to meet that uh, the 1.5 uh, degree uh, limit on warming that was established uh, in Paris. And some have lost uh, hope on that, but you know, maintain that with appropriate actions, we, might, we may be able to limit global warming to two degrees. Uh, if we look domestically here in Canada, you know, if you're following the news recently, there's been a litany of, of really interesting and controversial news related to the carbon tax uh, that was rolled out by the federal liberals. We're, we continue to see ballooning investment in fossil fuels. All this to say we are, we are moving in the wrong direction and all of this uh, spells bad news, not only for the future of infectious disease transmission, <clears throat> but for, certainly for a variety of other climate sensitive uh, uh, diseases uh, and impacts uh, more generally. The other, I think, uh, thing that's really fascinating that we continue to, to learn from, um, uh, from Ebola and, and SARS and, and, and other infectious diseases uh, is the important role of land-induced spillover, which we know is often driven by socio-ecological drivers, uh, and that many of these uh, trends are driven by exploitive capitalism are, are actually getting worse and not better. And so, you know, spillover in this context is really referring to when um, some environmental or socioeconomic change uh, allows an animal pathogen already transmissible to humans to come in contact with humans. And I love this, uh, this piece by, by Wegner. And um, in this example, we, we can kind of see how spillover of past outbreaks can be driven by some of those land use changes. So we see the, uh, the disruption of the idea of a, a kind of pristine forest where logging and illegal poaching uh, become rampant, leading to the proliferation of small mammals, which can act as disease rev reservoirs. That in contrast to the ecotone, these, these transition zones between biological boundaries, uh, here is one represented by farming, which again might contribute to the deforestation in that, of that pristine forest uh, uh, above, but also necessarily bring both wild and domesticated wildlife and, and animals into close contact with humans. And then certainly finally in human settlements, we kind of see uh, some of these trends of opportunistic invasion. There are examples of this all over the world uh, of wild animals entering urban areas in search for food due to the degradation uh, of their natural environment uh, and overcrowding and food deprivation may actually lead uh, to increased susceptibility of that wildlife to pathogen infection and to viral shedding. And so this is one of those reasons why it's believed that certainly the next pandemic will likely be zoonotic in origin. And it's precisely because of that unhealthy relationship with the natural world that's driving uh, some, of those, some of those changes. You can see some of those uh, uh, similar named pathways uh, on this slide. Uh, this is uh, taken from an article by Plowright and colleagues. Uh, here in terms of spillover. Um, you can also see a, a, a figure likely familiar to most of us in the wake of the pandemic, this Swiss cheese model of, of spillover. And while this might not necessarily seem like, uh, like ugly news to some, what it really demonstrates, I think, to me beautifully, is this complex array of collaborative relationships that are really needed at each stage to understand um, the, the barriers to spillover. And it really raises questions, I think, about how each of these disciplines needs to be working with each other at multiple stages to support early detection and, and warning, you know, genetic sequencing of emerging diseases, uh, treatment and, and prevention uh, among both animal and human populations and certainly finding ways to attenuate uh, exposure or disease replication um, through appropriate uh, interventions. And so in short, that, that kind of wicked challenge of emergence in complex systems really means we have to find efficient ways of working uh, with an array of likely and unlikely uh, uh, allies in this space and not just to rely on human and animal health as our bellwethers for infectious disease, but also ecological health more generally. Um, so, and, and many of our speakers have kind of mentioned this, we need to really de-silo our infectious disease practice, which is obviously um, easier said than done if history's taught us anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other ugly news is, uh, and we've heard some of this uh, uh, from our panelists in the last session, is that you know, in addition to a variety of tick-borne illnesses being endemic to Canada, the, the same is true for a variety of mosquito populations. Um, you know, areas of southern Canada in particular have uh, uh, suitable ecosystems to support a variety of exotic mosquitoes, uh, and in many cases, vectors capable of carrying a wide array of exotic tropical diseases that already exist in Canada. Um, and, and certainly, um, while at present this risk remains extremely low, it does create really novel and difficult questions for us to be asking ourselves today about what monitoring and surveillance needs to look like now so that we can actually start to detect signals 
uh, and trends in our environments and the changes therein uh, that may lead to future increasing risk of, of transmission under a changing climate. I think we're also uh, uh, learning through some really important emergent research uh, about the importance of feedback loops in these really complex systems. Um, so for example, you know, a recent lab testing by the U US Centers for Disease Control have shown that West Nile vectors are becoming increasingly resistant to insecticides. And, and certainly uh, cause for concern uh, for many uh, uh, mosquito-borne disease researchers and really uh, forces us to consider, well, what's next for vector control and, and, uh, and abatement? Um, you know, if we rewind the clock, uh, many of us, I think, had to live uh, uh, through um, Canada's worst wildfire season on record this year uh, and seeing the devastation certainly that it caused for communities and for people's livelihoods, the lasting mental health impacts of evacuations, the continued threat of evacuation for communities, uh, and certainly the compounding effects um, that, that that's going to have on, on different communities uh, as we await next year's wildfire season. Um, you know, that coupled uh, with this emerging research really demonstrates how certain infectious disease uh, interact with other pre-existing climate related hazards. And this is a piece uh, in Ecosphere that's actually looking at how wildfires create opportunities to aerosolize uh, viable microbial life, including mycotoxins from fungi by wildland fires. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you know, another a classic example that we saw of this during the during the pandemic in terms of the interacting nature of infectious diseases and climate driven hazards. You know, we know from 2020 and 2021 that if you were involved in responding uh, to, to wildfire smoke or to extreme heat and were participating in the establishment and the deployment of clean air shelters and cooling centers. Um, you know, it, you understand the difficulty that's associated with also necessarily having to uh, reduce the risk of, uh, of respiratory risk or respiratory um, disease transmission. And so those compounding factors, that complexity and that emergence are, are really um, significant drivers, I think, of, of where we need to be directing our latest and greatest thinking uh, in terms of planning and preparedness in this particular space. <clears throat> Finally, I, I think that you know the literature does a really good job reporting on uh, who's more or less at risk. Um, but I think we've done less of a good job, certainly in Canada and elsewhere, of really understanding the unique assets that each of these communities might actually have to offer, uh, especially in terms of protective factors against infectious disease transmission uh, and a, an array of other climate-related risks. So, you know, moving beyond the, um, the detriments model, which is so often conceptualized through things like uh, climate change and health vulnerability assessment, it's really forcing us, I think, in public health to ask uh, and to really rightfully and thoughtfully ask, you know, what is right, what is moral, what is just in terms of detection and in terms of reporting. Uh, noting, for example, that uh, many inequities in disease risk and mortality during the pandemic were, were actually hidden from us because we weren't systematically capturing robust sociodemographic data to detect um, some of those key differences in equity deserving groups and, and you know, su su simultaneously, I think, forces us to consider and ask what equitable approaches to intervention necessarily look like? What, what, is it, what does it look like in terms of a fair and just allocation of resources when we're actually conceptualizing our response uh, to an outbreak of infectious disease? And these are certainly not easy questions to answer. There's gonna be considerable geographic variability. We need to necessarily be considering uh, pre-existing uh, and established local health concerns uh, when, when balancing some of these things. Um, but what I'd like to do now is, is kind of turn my attention, um, uh, and I, I want to thank Kaylee Byers for, for kind of priming the pump, so to speak. Kaylee did a great job of introducing the One Health perspective, uh, and I want to just share some really high-level frameworks that are emerging from uh, the international scene and, and certainly national examples as well um, that might enable us to address um, some, of the, some of the bad and some of the ugly challenges that we're facing in this particular space. So let's talk a, a little bit about One Health approaches to infectious disease surveillance and, and whether it can offer us uh, more good uh, to potentially counteract some of the bad and some of the ugly. Um, this is a, a colleague just put me on to this, uh, this artwork by um, Lawrence Paul Yekwil Upton. Uh, Lawrence is a, a Cowichan and Sailks Indigenous artist, uh, and I, I absolutely love Lawrence's work. It's uh, 
not only just because of, of the vibrancy and the color and the way that this image literally just pops off the screen or necessarily just this incredibly provocative title, right? Killer Whale has a vision and comes to talk to me about proximological encroachments of civilizations in the ocean. But I think this to me is this beautiful encapsulation and uh, 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 epitomization of what the One Health uh, approach is and how it foregrounds necessarily the need to be humble, the need to listen to nature, and the need to necessarily reconcile our relationships with animals and the rest of the natural world. I really love uh, Lawrence's work because I think it's a it's one that engages in this deep sense of activism that we need to really take seriously in public health if we're if we're truly to move the needle on on, on climate change. Uh, and, and what's so necessary about it to, to resolving some of these entanglements between extractive capitalism and, and um, colonization that, that Dana was speaking to uh, earlier this morning. <clears throat> so One Health, um, uh, for those of you who missed uh, Kaylee's excellent presentation, you know, this is a, a now kind of 70 year old subfield of environmental health practice that really uses that animal human environmental triad as its foundation. Uh, or foundational context, I should say, for um, infectious disease transmission and investigation. Um, One Health really, you know, at its heart is an examination and a promotion of the interrelationships between human and animal health um, through interdisciplinary cooperation and collaboration. It's got strong roots in veterinary and human medicine. Um, and, and the intellectual landscape of One Health can actually be traced back uh, to the, the mid 19th century and the concept of one medicine. Uh, although it's worth noting that the, the field really has recently gained momentum in, in kind of the early 2000, uh, 2000s in response to uh, uh, SARS and avian influenza outbreaks. Um, we know from the literature that One Health uh, primarily focuses, focuses on zoonotic disease research, uh, communicable disease, uh, food safety, you know, nutrition, a strong orientation towards antimicrobial resistance. And certainly veterinary and public health practitioners have been the principal players in this particular field, um, as have conservation biologists and con uh, conservation medicine experts. Um, and again, as a result of that, that necessary integration, there's been a very strong focus on collaboration in this particular field, particularly among medicine, veterinary medicine, public health, and the environmental sciences uh, more generally. Um, this is a slide that's actually drawn from the Lancet One Health Commission, and the Lancet One Health Commission is a relatively recent development. It, it's really outlining um, some of the international relevance of, of certainly AMR, non-communicable and communicable diseases, uh, but also the necessary need to foreground this notion of our shared environment uh, and the need to be more effective uh, at things like sharing of medicines and interventions in the wake of the global pandemic, uh, and certainly the need for, for safe food uh, and food systems. Uh, and to do that work through cross-sectoral mobilization, uh, integrative science and policy. What I really wanna quickly return to <clears throat> is that, that artwork of Lawrence Paul uh, and to really help us uh, reconsider some of the incredibly helpful nudges, I think that Brett and Dana's opening remarks uh, that began our, our, our day. And just to riff off of that a little bit by saying that, you know, there's a, a really strong reminder that needs to be stated anytime we think about or introduce the concept of One Health or Eco Health or Planetary Health. And the reminder here is that, uh, you know, of all the emergence of all of these kind of novel environmental paradigms raise questions about needing to be mindful of past precedents and near neighbors and, and to really recognize the foundational understanding of environment, animal and human health interactions that are central to indigenous knowledge systems and ways of knowing and have been since time immemorial. And we've certainly lost many of those uh, connections to land in, in, in settler societies. So whether we call the work that we're doing environmental health, one health, eco health, planetary health, we need to recognize the historical precedents and certainly the ongoing leadership of Indigenous peoples and scholars in this space, uh, highlight how our, our, our necessarily iterative understanding uh, of these issues is definitely marked by increasing moves uh, towards uh, the, the type of integration that I'll be talking about uh, during the remainder of my presentation and necessarily merging our understandings of these multiple systems, multiple values uh, in, the, in terms of the ways that we understand infectious disease programs. And so we, we really need to reconcile relationships between ecosystems, non-human animals um, and, and humans. Um, 
this is where my criticism, I think, of, of, of One Health uh, could be extended and furthered a little bit. You know, it's, it's really notable that a lot of One Health frameworks are still necessarily anthropocentric insofar as reduction of human risk and human disease is ultimately what, stri what strive for, um, despite those three legs of the One Health stool. So in short, you know, demanding equitable consideration of each is, is, is definitely necessary from a truly integrated One Health approach. Uh, and it really raises the importance of interspecies equity, um, let alone environmental equity in this particular space. And I'll, I'll come back and speak a little bit to more, uh, more to that uh, at the end of the presentation in terms of solutions. Um, <clears throat> this is where I think One Health really has an opportunity to, to think about going upstream, to use that classic metaphor in public health, not just to necessarily focus on surveillance and infection control, but really to wade into less familiar territory um, like that of conservation and land use management and resource governance and sustainable development. Uh, in short, to give precedence to the health of environments uh, uh, that, and, and to really lean into what One Health I think is implicitly calling for, which is to be attentive to the dynamics of living systems. So One Health critiques have really been leveled at the paradigm for, for being overtly focused on kind of human and animal um, health prevention, primarily through vaccination programs. Uh, we necessarily need to consider environmental action, but also social equity in terms of that response. Um, so what, what do uh, approaches to landscape protection and rehabilitation look like, um, especially in relation to the, the issue of subsistence farmers and folks who actually uh, need that uh, and prioritize that um, to support their own livelihoods. Um, once we start to actually ask some of these ethical questions, um, uh, nothing is, is, is as easy as it seems from an intervention standpoint. It's one of the reasons actually why I really like that Lancet Commission uh, report. It really explicitly recasts equity and ethics as a necessary consideration in the deployment of the One Health perspective. So having given that, that kind of brief overview and some of its challenge, challenges, what I wanna do now is just point to some of the exemplars uh, of One Health surveillance work that's happening around the world and see what we might be able to glean from it here in the Canadian context. The first example that I want to point to is the WHO One Health High Level Expert Panel. Um, I really like this. There's a whole se a series of reports and action plans that are released as a part of this particular document. Uh, it was released, I think, in 2022. Um, but really what it's identifying are pathways to implementing a One Health perspective. Um, a lot of the material is largely boilerplate. It really you know, harkens back to that, that uh, Ogden slide that I started initially with uh, uh, from my talk uh, around the need to engage and bring together multiple actors. Uh, across uh, uh, all of society to build political will uh, within our own institutions and across institutions and across nations uh, to collaborate and bring One Health life through a focus on healthy ecosystems, healthy animals, and, and healthy humans. But moving beyond the, that, that kind of boilerplate statements, uh, it also goes much further in, in that it makes some very tangible recommendations around both prevention and preparedness response, uh, many of which I think have really important implications, not only for climate sensitive diseases, uh, but also for other infectious diseases as well. Um, I'm, I'm pulling in here actions 2.1 and 2.2 as particular examples uh, that, that really speak to the need to understand the drivers of emergence and spillover and spread. Uh, and, and processes to identify and prioritize those interventions. So for example, under action 2.1, the report really outlines the need for um, tangible risk assessments that speak uh, to the pressures and drivers of ecosystem health and their effect on disease prevention. So that's an important motivating factor um, to support ongoing conservation efforts and environmental stewardship. And to do that, um, not only through conventional modeling, um, but also through the collection of new data that speaks to the health of humans, uh, animals, and wildlife. Uh, it's notable here that here in Canada, we do have a new initiative that Statistics Canada is leading the census of the environment, uh, which is really, I think, creating novel opportunities for us to understand the environmental and human interface at a variety of discrete kind of biogeophysical scales, um, such as watersheds, for example, uh, that may offer us some really nuanced insights in that particular space. Under Action 2.2, you know, we, we can also see the need for um, that intersectoral and integrative policy solution uh, call, which need to be at the heart of, I think, any climate related response. Uh, there needs to be a recognition that we in public health certainly cannot do this work alone. This needs to be a whole of society or an all of society approach. Um, uh, the other thing that Action 2.2, I think, highlights is, is the need uh, to develop um, some very clear standards for health enabling ecosystem processes and the direct engagement of community uh, to identify sustainable solutions that enhance preparedness uh, and resilience, um, certainly with um, uh, social equity and health equity in mind. 
So importantly, you know, this is just, it's a really important call for, for integrated surveillance, not just looking at human health and animal health, but looking upstream at the drivers of spillover, uh, which include not only just climate change, but a variety of other global and societal pressures. Um, this is the UNEP, um, uh, FAO, WHO, um, WOAH uh, quadripartite zoonotics guide and one health plan of action. Um, there's a lot to like in this document. It's a fairly high level report that outlines kind of six key actions. Those six key actions that are that are named um, uh, that occupy kind of the center of that wheel and the figure on the left uh, include, uh, you know, needs for strategic planning and emergency preparedness, the surveillance uh, of zoonotic diseases and information sharing, uh, coordinated investigation and response, uh, joint risk assessment for zoonotic disease threats, risk reduction, risk communication and community engagement, and then finally workforce development. I, I think the thing that I, I, I really like about this, uh, especially the plan for action, and, and I think we've seen it in some of the comments uh, uh, today from, um, from some of the, um, the, the attendees, is noting the incorporation of environment uh, necessarily into One Health. Uh, and there's an explicit realization in the framework on the right that that environmental connection has largely been under-realized in the One Health space. Uh, it's largely been critique critiqued for being overly focused on vector control and transmission. So this is a framework that's explicitly seeking to remedy that. Uh, another uh, really, I think, interesting uh, move in a, <clears throat> a bit of a watch this space is the Berlin Principles One World, One Health uh, you can see a variety of the, the kind of four different calls to action listed on this slide. Um, one of the reasons why I've included this slide is, again, it's, it's a really explicit call to travel upstream and to really merge conservation science with One Health in a global health context. Uh, and so, again, necessarily evokes that kind of multidisciplinary um, intersectoral and cross-sectoral collaboration, uh, but to bring the environment component um, back in as a key driver and a key determinant uh, beyond just climate change, right? A lot of One Health analyses that, that we've seen in the climate state space certainly uh, might include a couple of different key climate variables, whether that's temperature or precipitation patterns into disease modeling, uh, but there are obviously a whole host of other environmental interactions that are necessary to conceptualize and consider. This is uh, uh, the last example that I wanna speak to. This is actually a hot off the press uh, uh, edition. So I think it's gonna take a little bit of time to see how this initiative actually comes together, but it's worth noting, um, this is the European um, ID or infectious disease uh, alert program. Uh, and, and I, I wanna just flag really quickly that even though the, the, the program is still in its infancy, in, in infancy there's an explicit uh, orientation towards integrative data solutions uh, and careful consideration of social inequities. So not only does this framework call, uh, echo calls for co-production of data, uh, you know, novel data streams of collection, but also the need for robust evaluation with the explicit goal of connecting emerging evidence with decision support tools uh, 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 to actually help guide decision-making on the ground for local to regional to national public health players. So I think this is definitely a watch this space. It's, it'll be really interesting to see how this initiative uh, uh, evolves uh, in the EU. So I just want to start winding down and just, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of information I think that's been provided. We've seen this, this kind of incredible emergence, uh, especially in the wake of the pandemic, uh, of renewed focus on One Health and One Health approaches. Uh, what I want to do now is just highlight a couple of other kind of challenges and opportunities that we need to be considering as we're kind of thinking about the continued and ongoing deployment of this particular approach uh, into the future of our practice. The first is one that I've, I, I mentioned at the outset, but it's worth spending just a little bit of time um, chatting about, which is really the moral and reputational injury that exists across the health system coming out of COVID-19. You know, we know that health systems across the country continue to be strained in the wake of the ongoing pandemic. Uh, we know that the workforce is struggling really significantly um, with burnout. We also know that there's a, a high degree of psychological trauma or moral injury coming out of the pandemic. Practitioners, you know, uh, under the incredible capacity strains, really rising to the occasion, uh, and, and they ought to be celebrated a, a, as heroes. But, you know, we've, uh, we've got a project running in DC right now where we're looking at the, the climate impacts on the health system workforce and really trying to probe at what some of this means and how we can actually build a more resilient workforce into the future. And we know that that, that moral uh, injury shows up in a couple of different ways. The first is this psycholo ongoing psychological trauma of, of trying to do, literally doing everything that people can do and still being overwhelmed with the actual state of the, the challenge that an infectious disease like COVID-19 has actually presented to the health system. 
The second is this idea of kind of reputational injury. And, and certainly, you know, we, some of our speakers have, have, have talked uh, a lot about misinformation uh, that was shared during the pandemic. Um, this is a, a, a crisis and an emergency in its own right. Um, but there has been a degree of trust that's been broken uh, between the public and the health system that needs to be um, rebuilt. Uh, this is a quote from one of our interviewees in that particular project, um, noting we've got a pretty big response from community and from the public around, you're not doing your job, you didn't do enough to respond to this situation, and uh, you, can, you can understand um, how that would necessarily strain the mental health of the workforce as they continue to re-engage uh, uh, with uh, novel files like climate change. The second, uh, <clears throat> I think, important call in a direction that we're definitely moving towards in Canada is uh, this idea of integrated surveillance and the need for really good, really rich, disaggregated data. Um, you know, calling for data, uh, the data that's needed to develop policy that effectively addresses um, systemic uh, inequalities. And in other words, what we're calling for here it is data that really reflects the lived experiences of many people and, and really allowing those stories to be amplified and heard by uh, heard clearly by those in power. Um, this is the grandmother perspective report that was put out in BC in September 2020, um, which is really a call for disaggregated demographic data in, in British Columbia. Um, and a lot of this, I think, echoes, uh, you know, Brett's calls to action this morning on, on the need for two-eyed seeing approaches. And I, and I think my kind of key takeaway from some of Brett's um, really uh, fascinating and insightful comments is that integrative surveillance uh, really means, uh, you know, not just the integration of environment and community and health values. It necessarily means mixing perspectives, mixing data points, mixing methods, and mixing worldviews to develop as comprehensive an understanding of a problem uh, as we, we, we can possibly build out. Um, Eric Liberda at uh, Toronto Metropolitan Uni University, which was formerly Ryerson, uh, just released a, a, a really nice piece uh, in the Journal of Developmental Origins of Health and Disease on the, this idea of two-eyed seeing, uh, which I think does a, a really nice job for those of you who might be interested in OCAP principles, that's the ownership, control, access, and provision, um, and its interface uh, uh, in disease surveillance with community-based participatory research, which I think really just further um, reinforces the critical role uh, of Indigenous people taking um, active roles uh, in, in research. Um, beyond that call for disaggregated data, we also know that, you know, if uh, vulnerability assessments are great, and I'll talk about them in a moment as, a, as kind of a planning tool, but they don't, uh, they don't necessarily tell us without really good, really robust disaggregated data, the compounding risks uh, uh, that um, systemic disadvantage and marginalization play in our society, and likewise, the compounding benefits that are accrued through, um, through the social construction of privilege. And so I think that, you know, as we kind of move towards a, a more democratic access towards data, you know, more clear provisions of disaggregated data and more sophisticated analyses of some of these complex uh, uh, ways in which we identify socially, um, I think that the, the benefits of that type of surveillance um, will, will really help us focus and target um, adaptation in initiatives in ways that are fair and are just because they're necessarily attending to some of the, the, the systemic drivers um, that we see in terms of how it manifests in, in, in physical differences in human health across time and space. Uh, this is this is a bit of a no-brainer, but I, I think it's just it's worth really. I haven't heard any of the speakers mention it uh, today necessarily, but uh, maybe not explicitly, uh, or maybe they did and I missed it. But I, I think it's uh, pretty apparent to everyone on the call that good surveillance, let alone good One Health surveillance, has to start with better clinical and better public awareness. Uh, and, and you know, we're, we're certainly starting to see um, more risk communication come out from regional health. Uh, uh, agencies across the country uh, on, on new and emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. You know, when we are engaged in this work uh, and, and leading one of Canada's first comprehensive climate change and health vulnerability assessments with the region of Peel. This is, uh, you know, kind of back in 20, 2010, um, so 13 years ago. Uh, we were working uh, uh, with some Lyme disease uh, data and, and some of the tracking and monitoring had started, but we were speaking with physicians and the active case definition of Lyme uh, necessarily needed to include the fact that whoever was exposed or had contracted Lyme needed to live in an area where Lyme was endemic. Uh, and uh, for a long time, even at that point, we didn't necessarily have really good risk-based risk, uh, risk -based evidence that suggests that Lyme was necessarily uh, endemic. But of course, we know the climate has changed. Uh, those tick species have certainly established themselves and were likely established well before 2010. 
Uh, and so that, that idea of good surveillance, it needs to start certainly at the point of diagnoses and, it, and even before then in terms of bolstering the public's awareness uh, of what some of the risks are and how they, those risks can actually necessarily be, in, be, be avoided. Um, and then certainly also to engage with emergency management. This is um, <clears throat> a, a really lovely uh, a report that came out of Teresa Tam's office um, this year that's called Creating Conditions for Resilient Communities, a Public Health Approach to Emergencies. You know, what I think I like about this report is that, you know, core to a determinants of health approach um, that is equitable is that, you know, we have to plan uh, with recovery and resilience in mind. And that's true of infectious diseases as it is for extreme heat, as it is for bouts of extreme weather. We really need to do a good job of fostering uh, engaged and connected communities to ensure that equity is centered in our planning processes and to make sure it's central to prevention, preparedness and response. You know, we know, we know that um, our, our experience from the pandemic is that we when we largely kind of deploy a utilitarian a, a approach. It's done at the expense of equity and our most vulnerable tend to suffer uh, the most. And so One Health, I think, if we're referring back to some of those uh, frameworks that I've just presented on, really calls for us to broaden our focus, um, especially in the prevention and mitigation aspect of disaster preparedness, again, to travel back upstream and really consider living systems in our planning process and our response. Um, but I think, of course, and, and importantly, this, this needs to be sustainable. We cannot continue to just keep feeding the emergency response beast, uh, which is certainly a response uh, or a, a recipe, I should say, for the failure of our, our health system, uh, especially when we think about this through the lens of a multitude of cascading and concurrent and compounding climate related impacts. Uh, you know, we have to engage in concerted planning now to address some of these structural and systemic drivers of, uh, of health inequities. Uh, to necessarily enhance our society's um, overall level of generalized resilience to a variety of climate-related shocks uh, with a focus on equity and justice in the process. You know, um, other changes, certainly, I think this is a really important point as uh, more jurisdictions start to roll out adaptation planning. We're seeing a huge focus on nature-based solutions, the development of blue and green infrastructure. And I think it's important to, to, to note that other changes that can affect disease emergence and re-emergence you know, may be related to public health adaptation in initiatives that are trying to reduce broader health risks of other climate-related hazards. So for example, uh, efforts to reduce heat islands in urban areas through the greening of cities and, and actions to manage floods might actually unintentionally uh, increase the risk of zoonotic uh, uh, transmission um, from wildlife and vector-borne diseases. Um, uh, additionally, you know, there's some really good examples of uh, increased use of air conditioning, for example, uh, to combat urban heat island effects, uh, necessarily uh, uh, increasing the risk of, of Legionella. And so if we're strategic, uh, I think we can prioritize prevention me measures that have multiple co-benefits and that, uh, that, so that a range of challenges are, are addressed uh, simultaneously. So for example, we might have um, agricultural practices that stand to mitigate uh, the impact of, uh, of particular land uses uh, while also reducing antimicrobial resistance and other zoonotic diseases at the same time. Um, but if we focus on, on, on simply just reacting, we're gonna be bound to eventually reach um, that tipping point uh, of, of no return. And this, I think, is, is, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges before us in this space. We really need to evaluate climate-related interventions, not just for infectious diseases, but for a variety of climate-related risks, um, so that we can build up on that contextual evidence through pilots, really understand what works, for whom, under what circumstances, uh, and really consider how those interventions may or may not be able to scale up um, across different jurisdictions, different geographies, uh, and different climatic regions across the country. That dearth of evaluative evidence is a really significant limitation at present uh, on the Canadian public health scene. Um, and yes, of course, you know, we need to make sure that as we intervene in future infectious diseases, thinking ahead to the next pandemic, whenever, wherever that may take place, that we aren't necessarily compounding existing ecological problems. Um, this is what I mean by ecological blindness uh, of the so-called One Health approach. Uh, and, and under the pandemic, you know, we in, in public health, our classic response and our classic orientation towards infectious disease, uh, we spent the majority of our time necessarily, again, um, directing our attention towards potential animal reservoirs uh, and the risks of human disease transmission. And as we rightfully tried to adapt, um, that inadequate consideration of environment led to considerable environmental impacts uh, and continue to lead to in considerable environmental impacts um, from the health system uh, more generally.
We were, we're also, I think, seeing some really great exemplars. Um, I, I spoke a little bit to this, and we're, we're certainly very fortunate in Canada uh, to be living in a relatively data-rich environment. And again, an environment where we've got really significant scientific expertise in the development and application and implementation of really sophisticated monitoring tools. Um, this is a, a, a paper that's really kind of looking at the variety of predictive models um, generated from um, web, web scraping and bioinformatics and genomics and earth observation that enable real-time tracking of infectious diseases uh, across time and space. Um, but I think, again, what's interesting to highlight in this, this host of papers that were analyzed in this paper is, again, some of those uh, existing ecological blindness challenges that we, we, we've raised already in this presentation, uh, whereby simply integrating climate data does not necessarily consider the broader dimension, dimensionality of environmental forcings on in infectious disease transmission and emergence. So we've still got work to do in that space, but it's a, it's a very uh, rapidly evolving space, especially uh, when we consider the development and deployment of AI tools. And I think that ecological blindness challenge <clears throat> uh, really also presents a, a governance challenge for us and one that demands a broader conceptualization of equity uh, beyond just within and between population groups. So there's some really uh, potent questions that we need to ask ourselves in this space. Who speaks for the salmon? Who speaks for the rivers and the oceans? Who speaks for the mountain uh, ecosystems? And to what extent can One Health um, help us adequately represent those interests and decenter humans as the sole focus of infectious disease preparedness. Um, and this is a this is a foundational and fundamental governance challenge. You know, how do we speak on behalf of other ecosystems and other species to, to hold ourselves to account? And here, I think we can take some governance lessons from um, you know things like the Cochabamba Accord of Bolivia on the rights of Mother Earth. Uh, the Wanganui River in New Zealand, for example, which was given legal status uh, of personhood in response to the assertion of indigenous Maori rights uh, in the river, uh, which now has two guardians appointed to speak for it uh, uh, on, on its behalf legally. And there are all kinds of really interesting and emerging governance uh, uh, opportunities that might enable us to do this work um, better and more representatively. Just to, to kind of tie a bow on my presentation and wind down, I, you know, I do, I do want to flag uh, and come back to some of my foundational experience um, developing and implementing climate change and health vulnerability and adaptation assessments. These have become really in vogue in public health over the, over the course of the last 10 years. Um, and I think that you know, they're, they're increasingly a, a very helpful approach to establishing really robust baselines of climate sensitive diseases, but I'm increasingly seeing them as organizational strategies. They're documents that help us collate existing evidence from our existing public health practice, make sense of them in the wake of future climate change uh, uh, risk projections, and then identify and, and work relationally with a variety of likely and unlikely allies in this space um, to, again, develop interventions that necessarily have uh, co-benefits and build credibility for public health act actors um, as climate change professionals in their own right. Um, so again, you know, uh, just echoing uh, what I've spoken to previously about um, the need for these assessments to, again, move a little bit beyond that detriments framing of vulnerability, um, really bring in intersectional analysis of risk profiles uh, of a variety of different regional pro uh, populations that are grounded, uh, not only in local geographies, but also local understandings of priority health risks um, and local capacity to respond. Uh, in my mind, I think that this relates back to our, our core, core challenge of, of, of bolstering our efforts to understand the costs and benefits uh, and evaluative effectiveness of different adaptation options uh, to help us control and mitigate infectious disease burden. You know, we really, we really need to amplify what works for whom under what conditions uh, and in what social ecological contexts, and, and to reconsider how we implement those options uh, across a range of upstream and downstream lo locations across that plow right Swiss cheese model. So, you know, in short, I think integrating One Health into surveillance means being attentive to the realities of living systems. And this really starts uh, by viewing climate driven health harms as social ecological phenomena and arguing that public health must control and contain, but also seek to prevent climate driven disease emergence by looking upstream at real people, real places and real practices. And that approach really, again, it's, it's this call to open up our, our understanding of what counts as data, what counts as information, um, how do we use both hard and soft scientific methods uh, that, that also necessarily invoke and involve uh, narratives of experience uh, and, and, and different values that help us inform development of models uh, used to study climate change and health. I want to note also that you know, in addition um, to the work that's referenced on this slide, uh, we do have the, the Royal Society of Canada One Health Task Force that's made some similar recommendations, not necessarily explicitly related to vulnerability and adaptation assessments, 
uh, but high level policy statements that are really directed towards implementing a, a Canadian One Health Action Plan uh, with support of governance structures and committees, um, appointing a special advisor on One Health to oversee activities across multiple ministries. That's almost like uh, calling for a minister of everything, for example. Uh, and certainly uh, uh, the last two recommendations that they highlight, the first is developing and implementing an Indigenous engagement and knowledge policy framework for One Health, uh, uh, basically a call for cross-governmental collaboration, and then uh, leveraging other important tools, uh, including effective conservation measures, um, Indigenous protected and conserved lands, and Indigenous-led monitoring activities that could be included, uh, included in an Indigenous uh, framework um, for One Health. So, just to wrap up, I, you know, I think we what I'm calling for again is this need to continue to enhance our understanding uh, of cell to so society scales and influences of infectious disease transmission. Transmission, um, planning and preparedness. You know, we we have to necessarily incorporate understandings of, of, of social equity and pre-existing inequities that risk being compounded without thoughtful action. Uh, and it, it's going to require a mix of, of upstream and downstream approaches and, and, and require a really keen attentiveness to the characteristics of, of, of li living systems. And I was really heartened, especially in Ariane's talk, just to hear about some of the ways in which those environmental partners are being brought in uh, to help support some of those kind of disease modeling efforts. I think that, you know, foundational uh, to my remarks today is that climate driven ill health is going to be produced at the interface of social inequities and environmental degradation. We're, we're only going to make inroads uh, when we emphasize the importance of addressing the causes of causes of social ecological health harms. And examples of those causes of causes include our uh, fossil fuel dependence, the unchecked intensive raw extraction of, of natural resources, um, overpopulation and overconsumption, uh, and poverty, as well as a host of other factors that, that are really accelerating the speed and scale uh, of impact uh, of climate change. And I think that identifying um, not only some of those social, uh, the social drivers, but those ecological drivers um, are really going to benefit um, from the use of, of things like systems thinking and complexity-based science uh, to help us understand the interplays uh, uh, across those kind of dynamic living systems. That's um, what my colleague Maya Gislason refers to as the, the social ecological approach that, that seems to be very central and very necessary to, the, to One Health deployment. But we obviously have more work to do uh, to ensure our, our tough talk on overcoming existing critiques of ecological blindness and the lack of operationalization of social equity in One Health research uh, to advance this field uh, in ways that are, are ecologically and socially just um, are actually achieved and achievable. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I really want to thank you for your kind attention. I know I'm the last speaker of the day, um, but really look forward to hearing from you. Um, I've got my contact details on this slide uh, and happy to take any questions, but thanks so much for your kind attention. Really engaging presentation, Dr. Busy. Um, and I think I can speak for everyone when I say that I think you did a wonderful job of kind of touching on um, and wrapping up a lot of the topics and themes and information that we've heard and been discussing throughout the day. So thank you again. Um, again, at this point, if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Busy, please use the Q&A feature. And I do think there's a couple coming in. Um, one from Brett, the one critique I have for many reports are that most of the health indicators listed do not represent Indigenous communities who are disproportionately impacted by variables that never are put into reports. Do you think there should be a bigger push for researchers to work with more Indigenous physicians, scholars, academics, and practitioners? Yeah, Brad, I think I think you've nailed the, uh, the the nail on the head with this comment, and I you know I I go beyond that. I think that you know the the centrality I think and the importance of some of this indigenous wisdom that's been lost, uh, uh, not only among settler populations, but the the way that that's been lost and not necessarily embedded in our institutions weakens them, uh, and and so we need to kind of reconnect some of those uh, some of those dots in practice. And the only way that we can do that is to, to reconnect um, with thoughtful leaders in that space who, again, have been carrying that wisdom um, since time immemorial. Um, there are a couple of really interesting examples. You know, one exemplar that I would point to, especially in the infectious disease control world, the First Nations Health Authority has done some work um, with the, the LEO network. This is the Local Environmental Observatory Network, an initiative that started out of Alaska. And it's a really cool geospatial tool. It brings up this, this big, beautiful map, and it's a community-engaged research project that's trying to connect um, local community members with experts, right? So if you go out uh, on a fish or a hunt, uh, you, could, you could necessarily, you know, uh, uh, 
as you're carving up the fish, you could look and there might be parasites inside. You could snap a photo, upload it to the actual platform and hopefully have an environmental health um, uh, specialist kind of comment on its effectiveness. Um, that's just one example of kind of, you know, very basic infectious disease uh, uh, um, programs that might help um, mitigate some of the risk. But Brett, I think to your point, it has to go from that very, very highly localized level all the way up to the, the levels of strategic policy and implementation. So really, really appreciate your, your thoughtfulness in that space. And kudos to you in terms of the way that you're foregrounding um, and centering Indigenous voices through, through some of your own work with the, uh, the Climate Atlas. Hats off. Thank you, Brett. Um, Dr. Busy, thank you so much for your talk and synthesis today. Could you please repeat the recent paper that was focused on an application of community-based monitoring and two-eyed seeing approach? Um, it was mentioned with the grandmother perspective. Oh yeah, Cassandra, thank you for that. It's um, <clears throat> maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll see if I can find it and post it in the Q and A. But the the paper, the last name of the author is Liberda. It's Eric Liberda uh, at Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, and the journal, I can pull it up here, is the Journal of Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. Um, so I, in the meantime, I'll, uh, I'll bring it up and see if I can just post it for you so you've got the link in the chat. Um, but Eric Liberta, Journal of Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, it was published, I think, in 2022. Um, I'll try and dig it up for you while I answer the next question. Thank you. Um, again, thank you, Chris, for this presentation. Could you please elaborate on data disaggregation, particularly in collection uh, in the collection of data for equity deserving groups? Often there are barriers in terms of collection and resistance resistance to new ideas of knowledge. Yeah, I I think it's fascinating watching this conversation play out in real time and. Uh, we were just last week, I was in a very interesting meeting. Um, PHAC is uh, in, engaging a variety of folks across the country and really trying to think about um, what the future of, of infectious disease surveillance looks like in Canada for what they're calling ID2030. Uh, and we had a very lively conversation uh, about the use and the need for disaggregated data. And, and you know, there are, there are some folks who would make the equation, like my colleague Arjuman Siddiqui at the, at the University of Toronto, where well, if we're measuring race, that's your explicit measure of, 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 of racism, right? That's your, your explicit measure of, of um, experiences of, of racism. Mm -hmm. In BC, what the grandmother report is, is really calling for is that it's saying not only do we necessarily need to, to measure those things, but we need to enhance the way that we report out on them. So we, we do regularly collect this data and they are accessible to researchers. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly administratively burdensome to access that data. And it's often hidden under the guise of privacy, right? Especially when we're dealing with health information and especially when we're dealing with with, with um, uh, especially low incidence diseases that become potentially identifiable. I, I think what we're seeing is a move away from privacy concerns. Um, and I don't know if that's part and parcel of living in a digital world where we provide so much information for free to big tech companies and people just don't care, care that much about privacy anymore or what's going on. Um, but I think the, the call to action here is that if we're really trying to take an equitable approach to, to understanding um, um, equity dynamics and especially health equity dynamics, we need to look at, at the, the intersection, not just of, of looking at the distribution of diseases according to race, but looking at the kind of compounding advantage or disadvantage that is conveyed by belonging or identifying with a whole set of, of different social groups at once, right? So the idea here is that it's not just the product of any one of those. There's something, um, there's something almost cumulative or, um, or you know, it, it, there's an exponential function that happens when we start to think about overlapping systemic disadvantage. And I think because the public doesn't have access um, to a lot of that information, it hasn't been made democratically available, um, it's hidden, and the, the argument is that it enables those inequities to perpetuate. Um, so the, the call for action that grandmother's report is we need to do a better job of, of not only um, uh, collecting that data, um, but reporting it out, um, and certainly reporting it out with, uh, with, with, with good ethics in mind and making sure that we're not necessarily identifying people. Um, but it's just come to light that, you know, the even reporting at a health unit level or reporting at a provincial level, it's not granular enough to, to inform a community-based response. So especially coming out of, out of the COVID-19 pandemic where people are increasingly da data savvy, we've got increasing access to information, you know, putting that information in the hands of community members so they can make sense of it, ground truth it themselves, um, provide feedback to, to us as a research community and to the practicing community um, is seen as one of these kind of key levers um, for, for equitable access to data and the necessary necessarily engendering an equitable response. Mm -hmm. 
And any suggestions on how to work with policy decision makers who are making decisions that are contrary to stated goals and values, for example, uh, returning to the office um, and climate goals, there seems to be a disconnect between leadership, decision making, and the reality of the situation. Yeah, I think that this is where we need to we need to kind of channel Dana in our everyday interactions with folks, and we need to be speaking truth to power. I, I you know, I, I was in a, a meeting the other day where someone told me that we we couldn't call climate change an emergency because emergency. Uh, con con connotates a particular understanding and a particular engenders a particular response from public health. And, you know, I, I, my colleague and I were kind of stepping back and saying to ourselves, like, holy crap, like our, like our house is literally on fire. When your house is on fire, you call that an emergency. You know, the, the challenge with climate change is that it's the slow moving emergency punctuated by acute emergencies. Mm -hmm. And the risk of, I think, conventional thinking, especially in the emergency preparedness response, um, is that we end up in a cycle of continual emergency response. We end up in a cycle where we're not evaluating the successes and the lessons learned from emergency to emergency. And we end up necessarily not folding those learnings into subsequent response, which means our emergency response system ends up becoming incredibly inefficient and incredibly bloated. So, you know, I, I think that the, the truth to power really just, it needs to come um, from all of us. Part of our kind of key role and responsibility in public health is to be advocates. And that also includes a role for advocacy within our own, within our own organizations. So I think that there are diplomatic ways that we can we can push back, um, you know, strategically and appropriately. Um, but I, I really, you know, like you, it sounds like I, I really struggle, I think, with um, this idea that we need to be um, diplomatic. The science is settled. I, you know, we if, if this is an emergency, I really don't know what is. Um, yeah. So we, we just that advocacy component, I think, is, is really, really important um, for mm -hmm. us publicly in our research and, and within our own organizations. Mm -hmm. And I guess keeping in mind, you know, what we can do, um, do you think there's a role that local public health units can play in promoting One Health amongst community members and local providers? Yeah, again, I'm not I'm not wed to One Health or any of these environmental health kind of paradigms or programs. I, I think what I'm trying to advocate for in my presentation, One Health is kind of the flavor of the week because it because of the global pandemic and because of the mm -hmm. emergency a lot of these pandemics um, that we've seen over the course of the last 25 years. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't some really good thinking tools that One Health can offer us, right? And some of those frameworks I've presented on, I think, provide really good fuel for future consideration around um, opportunities for us to intervene in the system. At a local level, I really, I really appreciated uh, Kaylee Byer's response to this question. I mean, I think at the heart of a really good, really robust, uh, really equity-informed One Health response at a local level is to step back and ask ourselves, who are the likely and unlikely allies in this particular space? Who's not currently engaged in this conversation that might have some wisdom or might have some insight that can actually help us as a public health organization or maybe a community service provider um, really move the needle? How could it enhance our communication? How could it enhance our, our preparedness? How could it enhance the interventions that we're, uh, that we're necessarily developing? Um, and how do we do that in a, in a way that's necessarily integrative and, and, and privileges um, equity? So I, I really liked Kaylee's response. I think it's, it starts with really good relationships on the ground. Uh, and I, I think that there are some, you know, really good models of, of governance and working groups that are being established across the uh, across the country. The INSPQ example in, in particular yeah. seems a really good response, a really good way of bringing together a, a variety of different uh, sets of expertise and a variety of different worldviews. Uh, and I think that, you know, for me, it's just it starts with being humble and it starts with recognizing that diverse groups of problem solvers are always going to outperform experts. Uh, it, we need to bring the diversity of thought into the room when it comes to that, that type of problem solving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and how can we improve implementation of ethical guidelines in rural and remote Canada with respect to public health surveillance, especially in the context of opioids, uh, the opioid crisis and um, communicable diseases? Yeah, this is an interesting question. It's, you know, <clears throat> I think for me, a lot of it comes back to um, principles that we've chatted about previously on this call, um, you know, whether that's FPIC or OCAP principles or ethical guidelines in terms of how we cast uh, information. I've, I've had the good privilege uh, of working with uh, Northern Health uh, in the context of both climate change and extractive resource uh, development over the last couple of years. Um, that's the Northern Health Authority here in BC. Uh, just for a little bit of context, that's a health authority that occupies a geographic space roughly the size of France with a population of only 300,000 people. 
Um, and it's also, you know, relatively as a result, um, uh, it has some very significant capacity challenges to implement public health services and programming across all of its respective communities because of that, uh, that, that kind of small end challenge. Um, so I, I don't know if wrapped up in this question is a, a question about kind of uh, reporting uh, and identification. Um, I don't know if it's a question about ethical guidelines uh, or, or ethical ways in which we engage with patient populations, but you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I really take uh, a good amount of fuel from my, my colleagues at Northern Health that are very, very good about starting with community voices and centering community voices first, learning from those experiences and then figuring out, okay, well, what does this actually mean for our practice? What does it mean for how we report out on, on, on particular information? And what, is it, what does that then mean in terms of our continued relationship with, with communities, which I think is an important question. So I think a lot of those, I, I, you know, I'm not spelling out particular ethical guidelines between uh, beyond FPIC and OCAP, but again, it gets back, I think, to that idea of working relationally and, and working collaboratively um, with community uh, in the pursuit of good health. Definitely. And bringing in that lived experience, too, I think is is key. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, heat and wildfire have caused significant impacts on BC populations. Climate change and infectious disease impacts are many times not organizational priorities due to the current low impact. How should we persuade leaders to focus on all aspects of climate change rather than just focus on heat and wildfire? I love this question. Um, this is something that I, I struggle with daily. And I think at the core of this question is what by what process do we prioritize different climate related risks? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that we can probably take uh, take at boilerplate some of the initial comments that I started by reflecting on that Canada does have a relatively high degree of adaptive capacity to, to vector borne disease. And a lot of these existing programs and practices have been in place in some cases for, for decades. So we've got a really firm foundation to, to be understanding some of these dynamics. Is there work to be done? Absolutely. Um, but I think the core to this question is because of the complexity of climate change, because of uh, you know, the, the, the variety of different drivers and climate related hazards, when we actually sit down, I think the most important question that, that um, health regions and researchers need to be asking are what, what are the criteria by which we're prioritizing, right? Are we just using simple burden of disease metrics um, to actually project out, okay, well, this we're, we're going to focus most of our attention because this is where most of the health impact and where most of the corresponding impact on our health system is going to be. Do we take a more equity driven approach uh, and really look at the demographic uh, demographic composition of our population, look at those risks in relation to those populations and try to target programming? You know, a lot of these decisions necessarily need to be um, need to be made locally. They need, need to be made with local climate risks uh, in mind. They need to be made with pre-existing population health concerns in mind um, and, and local geographies and lived experiences. Um, so I don't, I don't think that I can answer that question. I think it's highly variable depending on uh, the, the geography that you occupy. My only recommendation, and we did a little bit of this work uh, in, in the work that we led with um, uh, uh, the region of, of Waterloo and um, uh, Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph, uh, was we, we did a little bit of a rapid risk assessment that was trying to do that really difficult work of comparing apples to oranges across a variety of different climate related hazards. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we invoked uh, kind of a cross organizational panel that included epidemiologists, environmental health officers, us as a team of researchers, some of the management. Uh, and we try to struggle through this together, right? And we, we developed some criteria. And the, the, the biggest takeaway from that is, well, at least we have a transparent process that we can come back to and iterate upon um, once we get feedback uh, uh, from the public or once we have new information that becomes available to us uh, about the state of disease risk uh, from any one of those particular hazards. Um, so I think you have to start somewhere necessarily. We, we, can't, we can't wait, we can't you know, continue to support inaction. We need to develop some of those criteria. Um, starting uh, with a with a um, baseline value of transparency to me seems like a, a reasonably good starting starting place. Well said. Um, any suggestion regarding the application of OCAP principles in our shifting surveillance landscape? Yeah, I, I, I mean, this is an area that's, I think, in really rapid evolution. And I, I think we've, we saw some really good um, examples uh, of this in Brett's talk, um, mm -hmm. right, where so much of it stems with the strength of relationship that you have um, with the communities that you're working with. And I think it needs to uh, necessarily involve a shift in our mindset as re researchers, uh, as, as stewards of data, and to open up the, the possibility and the potentiality for broader public and community control over that information. 
Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, those OCAP principles, um, I'd really encourage you to check out that Eric Liberta paper. I think that there's some really good uh, insights in that particular piece of work um, that necessarily rely on processes. And I think that the, the, it's not necessarily um, a, a, a principle uh, or an application, but maybe a suggested method, which is uh, anytime we're collecting information and collecting data, um, we need to think about the evaluation of the collection and analysis of that data. And part of that process necessarily involves going back to community, reporting and enabling community members to, to ground truth and call bullshit when we get it wrong. And we get it wrong as researchers. That's the, that's the reality of any emergent space in science. Um, but we need to create those feedback mechanisms and those feedback loops um, so that, the, that people and community members themselves can see themselves in that data. When they see themselves in that data, they're gonna be more involved uh, and, and activated uh, to do something about not only the causes of causes, but some of, these other, um, some of the other challenges that we've encountered ethically uh, in terms of reporting. Mm -hmm. So I think that that Eric Liberta paper is a re really good uh, example, but in my mind, I think that question is really a call for more community engaged and participatory research uh, in the analysis uh, and unpacking of the data that we're collecting in the infectious disease space. And one last question uh, to end the day, how can we consider other health impacts like mental wellness when we consider the implementation of a One Health approach, especially as related to equity deserving populations? This is the this is the big question. I think this has been kind of the question of the year in the climate change and health space. Uh, so much emerging work in uh, in the mental health space uh, in in uh, in Canada writ large. It's uh, we're leading uh, one of Canada's first ever provincial um, risk and resilience assessments right now in collaboration with the Ministry of Health here in British Columbia. Uh, and it's, uh, it's ballooned into such a huge chapter and it's come up so often, um, not only in terms of mental health impacts to community, but also mental health impacts to workforce that it's uh, necessitated its inclusion as its, as its own chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think it increasingly what we need to um, recognize first and foremost is that we in the public health workforce are humans. <laughs> We know that we're suffering with, uh, you know, a combination of challenges, not only in addition to burnout, but also cognizant of these dynamics of eco-anxiety that are present across the broader populations. We're first and foremost community members ourselves. Um, I think second to that is, uh, you know, the call for integration that I think is central to a lot of these um, One Health approaches. Uh, means uh, acknowledging um, this, this division that exists in a lot of health systems between mental and physical health uh, uh, reporting, mental and physical health treatment, uh, and finding ways to necessarily integrate those two things so that we can see the dynamic connection uh, uh, between the two. Um, I think a lot of this also ties back to the need for more nuanced um, surveillance and understanding. We, we know that we do a really good job of even reporting heat related deaths. We know from the, um, the coroner's report in BC during the 2021 heat dome, those numbers are likely a drastic underestimation of the full burden of, uh, of uh, heat related deaths and heat related morbidity. Uh, the same is, is definitely true for mental health il illness. I think we're still struggling to figure out what the true burden of disease is. Uh, and, and so I think it's really uh, forcing us to ask questions. What does robust surveillance in that particular space look like? How do we get closer to the true, the true end? And what does that burden of disease then mean in terms of how we design a commensurate response? Um, it's a bit of a roundabout way to, to, to asking or to answering your question, but I, I think it's worth noting that there are some really um, interesting examples. Um, I'm going to pull up one. I've got a colleague, Kip Ricard uh, at Simon Fraser University, um, who leads a climate change and mental health uh, collaborative. Um, and I'll see if I can pop in the chat before and Maddie might be able to uh, yeah. be able to share it before we part ways. But they do a bunch of stuff like host conferences and publish papers and um, bring uh, awareness uh, to that particular space. It's called the Mental Health and Climate Change Alliance, mhcca.ca. Um, I'll, I'll pass it off to Maddie here. Wonderful, yes, I'll copy this to everyone. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you, Chris. Um, Thank you again so much. And thank you to everyone for joining day one of the Infectious Disease and Climate Change Forum and for your thoughtful